Two days after, a considerable crowd has gathered. Toward ten o'clock in the morning, round the door of Wilford's house, and a long file of mourning coaches, coaches and private carriages extended along the Faubourg Saint Honor and Rue de la uh, Rapinier. Among them was one of the very singular form, which appeared to have come from a distance. It was kind of covered wagon, painted black, and was one of the first at the rendezvous. Inquiry was made, and it was ascertained that, by a strange coincidence, this carriage contained the corpse of Marquise de Saint Mirren, and that those who had come for one funeral would follow two corpses. The number was great. The Marquise de Saint Mirren, one of the most zealous and faithful dignitaries of Louis XVIII uh, and King Charles X, had preserved a great number of friends, and these added to the personage whom the usage of society gave Wilford a claim on, formed a considerable body. Due to information was given to authorities and permission obtained that the two funerals should take place at the same time. The second hearse, decked with the same funeral pomp, was brought to Wilford's store, and the coffin removed it, removed into it from the wagon. The two bodies were to be interred in the cemetery of Père Lachaise, where Wilford had long since had a tomb prepared for the reception of his family. The remains of poor René was already deposited there, whom, after ten years of separation, her father and mother were now going to rejoin. The Parisians, always curious, always affected by funeral display, looked on with religious silence, while the splendid procession accompanied to their last adobe of two numbers of the old aristocracy celebrated for traditional spirit, for fidelity to engagements and sincere devotion to principle. In one of the morning coaches, Beauchamp, Debray, and Chateau Renaud were talking of very sudden death of the Marchioness. I saw Madame de saint Mirren only last year at Marseille, said Chateau Renaud, and would have supposed she might have lived to be a hundred years old, from her apparent sound health and great activity of mind and body. How old was she? Friends assured me, replied Albert, that she was seventy years old, but she has not died of old age, but of grief, it appears, since the death of the Marquis, which affected her very deeply. She has not completely recovered her reason. But of what disease did she, then, die? asked the Bray. It is said to have been a congestion of the brain, or apoplexy, which is the same thing, is it not? Nearly. It is difficult to believe it was apoplexy, said Beauchamp. Madame de saint Mirren, whom I once saw, was short of slender form and of a much more nervous and sanguine temperature. Grief could hardly produce apoplexy in such a constitution as that of Madame de saint Mirren. At any rate, said Albert, whatever disease or doctor may have killed her, Madame de Villefort, or rather Mademoiselle Valentine, or still rather our friend Franz, here is a magnificent fortune, amounting, I believe, to 80,000 livres per annum. And this fortune will be doubled at the death of the old Jacobin Nortier. That is a tenacious old grandfather, said Beauchamp. I think he must have made a bet with death to outlive all his heirs, and he appears likely to succeed. He is the old conventionalist of 93, who said to Napoleon in 1814, you bend because your empire is a young stem, weakened by rapid growth. Take the republic for tumor. Let us return with renewed strength to the battlefield. I promise you 500,000 soldiers, another Marengo, and a second Austerlitz. Ideas do not become extinct, sire. They slumber sometimes, but only revive the stronger before they sleep entirely. Ideas and men appear the same to him, said Albert. One thing only puzzles me. Namely, how Franz de Pinay would like a grandfather who cannot be separated from his wife. Where is Franz? In the first carriage with Monsieur de Villefort, who considers him already as one of the family. Such was the conversation in almost all the carriages. These two sudden deaths, so quickly following each other, astonished everyone. But no one suspected the terrible secret which Monsieur d'Avrigny had communicated in his nocturnal walk to Villefort, 
They arrived in about an hour at the cemetery. The weather was mild, but dull, and in harmony with the funeral ceremony. Among the groups which flocked toward the family vault, Chateau Renaud recognized Morel, who had come alone in a cap, and walked silently along the path bordered with yew trees. You there, said Chateau Renaud, passing his arm through the young captain's. Are you a friend, friend of Villefort's? How is it I have never met you at his house? I am no acquaintance of Madame de Villefort's, answered Morel, but I was of Madame de Saint Mirren's. Albert came up to them at this moment with friends. The time and place are but ill suited for our introduction, said Albert, but we are not superstitious. Monsieur Morel, allow me to present you present to you Monsieur Franz Depinay, a delightful travelling companion, with whom I made the tour of Italy. My dear friends, Monsieur Maximilian Morel, an excellent friend I have acquired in your absence, and whose name you will hear me mention every time I make any allusion to affection, wit, or amiability. Morel hesitated for a moment. He feared it would be hypocritical to accost in a friendly manner the man whom he was tactically opposing, but his oath and the gravity of the circumstances recurred to his, to his memory. He struggled to conceal his emotion and bowed to friends. Mademoiselle de Villefort is in deep sorrow, is she not? said the brave to France. Inexpressibly deep, replied he. She looked so pale this morning, I scarcely knew her. These apparent simple words pierced Morel to the heart. This man had then seen Valentine, spoken to her. The young and high-spirited officer required all his strength of mind to resist breaking his oath. He took the arm of Chateau Renaud and turned toward the vault, where the attendants had already placed the two coffins. This is a magnificent habitation, said Beauchamp, looking toward the mausoleum. A summer and winter palace. You will in turn enter it, my dear Depunay, for you will soon be numbered as one of the family. I, as a philosopher, should like a little country house, a cottage down there under the trees, without so many cut stones over my poor body. In dying, I will say to those around me what Voltaire wrote to Byron, A runs, and will be, and all will be over. But come, friends, take courage. Your wife is the heiress. Indeed, Beauchamp, you are unbearable. Politics have made you laugh at everything, and the political men have made you disbelieve everything. But when you have the honor of associating with ordinary men, and the pleasure of leaving politics for a moment, try to find your affectionate heart, which you leave with your stick when you go to the chamber. But tell me, said Beauchamp, what is life? Is it not a halt in death's anteroom? I am pre prejudiced against Beauchamp, said Albert, drawing Fez away, and leaving the former to finish his philosophical desertion with Debray. The Villefort vault formed a square of white stones, about twenty feet high. An interior partition separated the two families, and each compartment had its entrance door. Here were not, as in other tombs, those ignoble drawers, one above another, where econ economy enclosed its dead with an inscription resembling a ticket. All that was visible within the brown gates was a gloomy-looking room, separated by a wall from the vault itself. The two doors before mentioned were in the middle of this wall, and enclosed the Villefort and St. Miran coffins. There, grief might freely expend itself without the flirting couples or trifling loungers who came from a picnic party to visit Pierre Lachaise, disturbing by their songs, their shouts, their running to and fro, the mute ev re reverie or the tearful prayer of the mourner in the tomb. The two coffins were placed on trestles previously prepared for their reception in the right-hand division belonging to the St. Mary family. Villefort, France, and a few near relatives alone entered the sanctuary. As the religious ceremonies had all been performed at the door, and there was no address given, the party all are separated. Chateau Renaud, Albert, and Morel went one way, and Debray and Beauchamp the other. France remained with Villefort, and the gate of the ceremony, Morel made an excuse to wait. He saw France and Villefort get into the same morning coach, and thought this tete -a tete foreboded evil. He then returned to Paris, and although in the same carriage with Re Chateau Renaud and Albert, he did not hear one word of their conversation. As France was about to take leave of Villefort, 
When shall I see you again? said the latter. At what time you please, sir, replied Franz, as soon as possible. I am at your command, sir. Shall we return together? If not unpleasant to you. On the contrary, I shall feel much pleasure. Thus, the future father and son-in-law stepped into the same carriage, and Morel, seeing them pass, become uneasy. Wilford and Franz returned to the Faubourg St. Honor. The procureur, without going to see either his wife or his daughter, passed rapidly to his cabinet, and, offering the young man a chair, Monsieur Depinay, said he, allow me to remind you at this moment, which is, perhaps, not so ill-chosen as the first sight may appear. For obedience to the wishes of the departed is the first offering which should be made at their tomb. Allow me, then, to remind you that of the wish expressed by Madame de saint Meuron on her deathbed, that Valentine's wedding might not be deferred. You know the affairs of the deceased are in perfect order, and her will bequeath to Valentine the entire property of the saint Meuron family. The notary showed me the documents yesterday, which will enable us to draw up the contract immediately. You may call the notary, Monsieur Deschamps. Please, pour vous, Faubourg saint honneur and you have any authority to inspect those deeds. Sir, replied Monsieur Depinay, it is not, perhaps, the moment for Mademoiselle Valentine, who is in deep distress, to think of her husband. Indeed, I fear Valentine will have no greater pleasure than that of fulfilling her grandmamma's last injunctions. There will be no obstacle from that quarter, I assure you. In that case, replied Franz, I shall raise none. And you may make arrangement when you please. I have pledged my word and shall feel pleasure and happiness in adhering to it. Then, said Wilford, nothing further is required. The contract was to have been signed three days since. We shall find it all ready and can sign it today. But the morning, said Franz, hesitating. Fear not, replied Wilford. No ceremony will be ne neglected in my house. Mademoiselle de Villefort may retire during the prescribed three months to her estate of St. Mary. I say hers, for she inherits it today. There in a week, if you like, the civil marriage shall be celebrated without pomp or ceremony. Madame de St. Mary wished her daughter should be married there. When that is over, you, sir, can return to Paris while your wife passes the time of her mourning with her mother-in-law. As you please, sir, said Franz. Then replied Villefort. Have the kindness to wait half an hour. Valentine shall come down to the drawing room. I will send for Monsieur, M Monsieur Deschamps. We will read and sign the contract before we separate. And this evening, Madame de Villefort shall accompany Valentine to her estate, where we will join them in a week. Sir, said Franz, I have one request to make. What is it? I wish Albert de Morcerf and Royal de Chateau Renaud to be present at the signature. You know they are my witnesses. Half an hour will suffice to apprise them. Will you go for them yourself, or will you send? I prefer going, sir. I shall expect you, then, in half an hour. Baron and Valentine will be ready. Franz bowed and left the room. Scarcely had the door closed, when Wilford sent to tell Valentine to be ready in the drawing room in half an hour, as he expected the notary and Monsieur Depinay and his witnesses. The news caused a great sensation throughout the house. Madame de Villefort would not believe it. Valentine was thunderstruck. She looked around for help and would have gone down to her grandfather's room. But meeting Villefort on the stairs, he took her arm and led her into the drawing room. In the ante room, Valentine met Barrows and looked despairingly at the old servant. One moment after, Madame de Villefort entered the drawing room with her little Edward. It was evident that he had sh she had shared the grief of the family for she was pale and looked fatigued. She sat down, took Edward on her knees, and from time to time pressed almost convulsively to her bosom this child, on whom her affections appeared centered. Two carriages were soon heard on to enter the courtyard. One was the notary's, the other that of France and his friends. In a moment, the whole party was assembled. Valentine was so pale, one might trace the blue veins from her temples and her eyes and down the cheeks. Franz was deeply affected. Chateau Renaud and Albert looked at each other with, an, a, with amazement. The ceremony which was just concluded had not appeared more sorrowful than did 
that which was convincing. Madame de Villefort had placed herself in the shade behind the velvet curtain, and as she constantly bent over her child, it was difficult to read a, the expression of her face. Villefort was, as usual, unmoved. The notary, after having, according to the customary method, arranged the papers on the table, taking his place in an armchair, raised his spectacles, turned toward France. Are you, Monsieur Franz de Quesnel, Baron de Pinay? asked he, although he knew it perfectly. Yes, sir, said Franz, the notary bowed. I have then to inform you, sir, that the request of Monsieur de Villefort, that your projected marriage with Mademoiselle de Villefort, has changed the feeling of Monsieur Nortier toward his grandchild, and that he disinherits her entirely of the fortune he would have left her. Let me hasten to add continued he, that the testator, having only the right to, to alienate a part of his fortune, and having alienated it all, and will not bear scrutiny, and is declared null and void. Yes, said Villefort, but I warn Monsieur de Pinay, that during my lifetime with my father's will shall never be scrutinized, my position forbidding any doubt to be entertained. Sir, said Franz, I regret such a question has been raised in the presence of Mademoiselle Valentine. I have never inquired the amount of her fortune, which, however limited it may be, exceeds mine. My father has sought consideration in this alliance with Monsieur de Villefort. All I seek is happiness. Valentine imperceptibly thanked him, and the, while two silent tears rolled down her cheeks. Besides, sir, said Villefort, addressing himself to his future son-in-law, Accepting the loss of a portion of your hopes, hopes, this unexpected will not need not personally wound you. Monsieur Nortier's weakness of mind sufficiently explains it. It is not because Mademoiselle Valentine is going to marry you that he is angry, but because she will marry. A union with any other would have caused him the same sorrow. Old age is selfish, sir, and Mademoiselle de Villefort has been a faithful companion to Monsieur Nortier which she cannot be when Madame de la Baron d'Epinay. My father's melancholy state prevents our speaking to him on serious subjects, which the weakness of his mind would incapacitate him from understanding, and I am perfectly convinced that at the present time, although he knows his granddaughter is going to be married, Monsieur Nortier has even forgotten the name of his intended grandson. Villefort had scarcely said this when the door opened and Barrows appeared. Gentlemen, said he, in a tone strangely firm for a servant speaking to his masters under such solemn circumstances. Gentlemen, Monsieur Norti de Villefort wishes to speak immediately to Monsieur Franz de Quesnel, Baron de Pinay. He, as well as the notary, that there might be no mistake in the person, gave all his title to the bridegroom elect. Villefort stared. Madame de Villefort let her son slip from her knees. Valentine rose, pale and dumb as a statue. Albert Chateau Renaud exchanged a second look. More full of amazement than at first, the notary looked at Villefort. It is impossible, said Procure du Roi. Monsieur Depinay cannot leave the drawing room at present. It is at this moment, replied Barros, with the same firmness. That Monsieur Nortier, my master, wishes to speak on important subjects to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. Grandpapa Nortier can speak now, then, said Edward, with his habitual quickness. However, his remark did not make Madame de Villefort even smile. So much was every mind engaged, and so solemn was the situation. Tell Monsieur Nortier, returned Villefort, that what he demands is impossible. Then Monsieur Nortier gives notice to these gentlemen, replied Barrows, that he will give orders to be carried to the drawing room. Astonishment was at its height. A kind of smile was imperceptible on Madame de Villefort's countenance. Valentine instinctively raised her eyes, as if to thank heaven. Pray go, Valentine, said Villefort, and see what this new fancy of your grandfather's is. Valentine rose quickly and was hastily, joyfully toward the door, when Villefort uttered his intention. Stop, said he, I will go with you. Excuse me, sir, said Franz. Since Monsieur Nortier sent for me, it is my part to attend to his wish. Besides, I shall be happy to, to pay my respects to him, and not having yet had the honor of doing so. 
Pray, sir, said Villefort, with marked uneasiness. Do not disturb yourself. Forgive me, sir, said France, in a resolute tone. I would not lose this opportunity of proving to Monsieur Nortier how wrong it would be of him to encourage feelings of dislike to me, which I am determined to conquer, whether they may be by my devotedness. And without listening to Villefort, he rose and followed Valentine, who was running downstairs with the joy of a shipwrecked kid mariner who finds a rock to cling to. Villefort followed them. Chateau Renault and Morcerf exchanged a third look of increasing wonder.